Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whatever time it is, I do hope that you are having a good time. This is the fourth in a series of YouTube videos, the third that is required homework for people who are in my English class at Hokkaido University of Education. As always, I want to begin with a review of the previous lecture. And then after that, we're going to today look at two more ideas that are key to making good arguments in critical thinking. So in the previous lecture, one of the main concepts that we talked about, going back even to the very first lecture, is that something is logical if the meaning of each part is clear, the parts are connected, the order of the parts easily leads to the conclusion, and the role of each premise supports the conclusion. And central to this was the idea of a statement. A statement is a claim that can either be true or false. Now, this is a really important feature, so I can't emphasize it enough. And we divide these statements into a conclusion, which is what we're trying to support, and premises, which are the things that we think are true or likely, or at least would help to support that conclusion. So a statement, again, is something that can be true or false. For instance, 3 p.m. is in the afternoon is a good statement. Uh, what is the square root of 6 is not a statement, because it is a number, but it is neither true nor false. Now, if I were to tell you that 2.5 is the square root of 6, that would be a statement, and it would be a false statement. So the other thing we learned last time that's extremely important, I can't emphasize this enough, is how to identify the premises and the conclusion. So I'll repeat this now, as I do every semester. This will be on multiple quizzes, multiple tests. The very first thing you do when you see an argument is identify the premise and the conclusion. Again, the very first thing you do when you see an argument, identify the premises and the conclusion. So how do we do that? we ask ourselves, what are they trying to prove? What are they trying to convince us of? That's the conclusion. What are they leading to? That's the conclusion. The other statements are automatically the premises. Now, we need to figure out which are which, and one thing that can really help us is indicator words. Indicator words, such as therefore, thus, so, ergo, and then, will tell us we have a conclusion coming. Whereas, Words like because, since, if, and given that can tell us that a premise is coming. So because I like ice cream, I like Hokkaido soft serve. Here the conclusion is I like Hokkaido soft serve, and the premise is because I like ice cream. So I'm going to give you a couple more things that we can work with. The other important idea we learned last time is there are two what we would call natural ways to structure an argument. So there are two good ways to organize an argument. First, there's conclusion, premise, premise. So flying squirrels are the best because they are the cutest and they live in Hokkaido. So this argument is one that my wife will often use. Second one, premise, premise, conclusion. If you want to do well, you should study. You want to do well, so you should study. So one of the important ways that we can look at these are indicator words. And in the top argument, we have one indicator word. That's the word because. After the word because, we know the next thing that's coming is going to be a premise. In the second argument, there aren't any good indicator words. Now, I want to repeat this because it will matter for this time. Something is logical if the meaning of each part is clear, the parts are connected, the order of the parts easily leads to the conclusion, and the role of each premise supports the conclusion. These are the keys to making a logical argument. Let's get to this week's ideas. So this week, I want to focus on two concepts. One is the concept of clear, the other is the concept of loaded. Now, when we make an argument, we can look at things in pairs, concise and verbose, consistent and inconsistent, concrete and abstract. 
And then with loaded things, emotional, biased, nuance. These are different things that relate to each of these concepts. So to be concise is to have konketsuse, which is to say to use as few words as are necessary. To be consistent is to do the same thing every time that you need to, ikandishite. To be concrete is to be the opposite of abstract. Now, concrete in this case means gutaiteki, and abstract is chushoteki. So, how can we go about being clear, and how can we go about avoiding loaded language? Now, Anthony Weston divides these a little differently than I'm doing here, and I'm kind of rewarding what he has, but I would say if you want to make clear arguments, be concrete, be concise, be consistent. If you want to make arguments where the pieces work towards your conclusion in terms of logic, argue based on logic, not emotional or loaded language. So this week we'll mostly focus on how to be clear. So I'm going to give some examples to help you understand what each of these terms means. So, again, be clear by being concrete, concise, and consistent. So we can kind of see some paired opposites here. So being consistent is the opposite of being vague. Concrete is the opposite to being abstract. And concise is kind of an opposite to being general. So there are different things that we can do to help make our arguments better. So again, abstract is the opposite of concrete. So I'm going to give some examples. I'm going to talk about whether they're concrete, whether they're abstract. So if I just said she is a bad student, this is very abstract. I haven't really said anything. Why? The simple answer is that the way I'm using the word bad here is unclear doesn't really say what I mean by that. Do I mean that she commits crimes? Do you, I mean she doesn't do her homework? What do I mean? So, she is lazy and not considerate. So this is better, because now we have some ideas of what she's doing. She is lazy, and she does not think about other people. So these are both helpful in making this more concrete. Still not very precise. Alright, she does not do her homework, so now we're explaining how she's being lazy. And also, she leaves trash on her desk after class, so now we're explaining how she's not being considerate. So now we're doing a lot better. Another way to say this is that concrete language expresses facts. So if what we're saying is things that are true, this is really helpful for what we're talking about. So let's practice a little bit. So I know this itself is a little bit abstract. So I will read each of these items. I want you to tell me whether they are concrete or abstract. Do not do bad things. Do not eat ice cream on Tuesday. Do well in life. You should marry him. You should marry Jane. I like all foods. Let's see how you can do in these. So do not do bad things. Abstract. We haven't said what bad things. Alright. Do not eat ice cream on Tuesday. Concrete. So this is very specific. We're saying exactly what it is that you want to do. So even though it says on Tuesday, you might think, well, there are many Tuesdays. But just in the way that we speak languages, if we said don't eat ice cream on Tuesday, we usually mean this Tuesday. So do well in life. So this is an abstract. Why? Uh, well, what is it to do well in life? Is it to do well in life to become a high school teacher? Is it to do well in life to become a university professor? Is it to do well in life to become a stock trader in Tokyo or in New York? You tell me. So you should marry. This is very abstract. It doesn't say who you should marry, when you should marry, any of those things. All right, what about you should marry Jane? So again, it says you should marry. 
I'm going to say this is pretty concrete. And the reason I'm going to say that is this is pretty clear as to who, probably pretty clear as to a time frame. Normally, if someone says you should bury someone, they don't mean 40 years from now. They mean soon. Last one. I like all foods. This is kind of abstract because it's probably not entirely true. So does that mean that I like cheese? Does that mean that I like meat? Does that mean that I like all vegetables? Do I enjoy both carrots and deer meat? You tell me. Without any more details, it's kind of abstract. And things that are abstract are a little bit vague when we put them in arguments. Next concept. Be concise. So I'm going to read a very long sentence. For all intents and purposes, the reason Mr. Henderson arrived late for work was due to the fact that he stopped at very many traffic lights that were red in color. I'll read that again. For all intents and purposes, the reason Mr. Henderson arrived late for work was due to the fact that he stopped at very many traffic lights that were red in color. Easier version, Mr. Henderson was late because he had to stop at many red lights. Same meaning. This is hard to understand, this is easier to understand. Smoking tobacco can cause humans to suffer unnecessary consequences. True. But it'd be easier just to say, smoking causes lung damage. Last one. The existence of computers and computer technology has greatly influenced commercial enterprise and information exchange. The existence of computers and computer technology has greatly influenced commercial enterprise and information exchange. Simple version. Computers have helped business and communication. So there's a very easy pattern in every single one of these. I'm going to highlight it for you. The pattern, this is very, very long. This is short. Again, long, short. That's the pattern. Concise means say it as easily as possible. Use as few words as you can. All right, next concept. All right, we're going to practice this a little bit. Say only what you need for your argument. So, Mrs. Adams, 5 foot 4, aged 40, is a computer programmer who works at Microsoft and an expert in Shoto, and she says Heather's handwriting is very good. Number two, Heather is always praised by her Shoto teacher. Therefore, Heather is good at Shoto. So, the conclusion we want is Heather is good at Shoto. In the first premise, there's a lot of things we don't care about. So we don't need to know that she's 5 foot 4. We don't need to know that she's 40. We don't need to know that she's a computer programmer. We don't need to know that she works at Microsoft. All we need to know is the last part. So, Mrs. Adams, an expert in Shoto, says Heather's handwriting is very good. Heather is always praised by her Shoto teacher. With that, we have enough to say our conclusion. And it's a better argument, because it doesn't say things it doesn't need to. Okay, be consistent. Being consistent means using the same term to say the same thing. So every time you want to say something, use the same word for the same meaning. Now, let's just put this in parentheses. If you're making a really long argument, 20 pages, 50 pages, 100 pages, you may want to change the word a few times. Not change the meaning of the word, but use different terms sometimes. If you're making a two-page argument, please use the same word to mean the same thing every time. So let me give you an example. Don't do this. Do not do this. If you want to be a teacher, then you should go to HUEA. That's a short word for Hokkaido University of Education, Asalikawa. One wants to be an educator. Thus, you should go to Kyodai, also a term for Hokkaido University of Education. 
So this argument changes words for no reason. So let's look at the same argument, but clearer. If you want to be a teacher, you should go to HUEA. You want to be a teacher, you should go to HUEA. So we've got multiple things going on here. First, the word teacher became educator, so we're just making it teacher, teacher. Second, HUEA became Hokyodai. We're just making them both HUEA and HUEA. So this is the idea. Use the same word every time. Let's give you a second example. So Janice does not believe she has cancer. Miss Smith thinks that the allergy medicine she takes is curing her tumors. Sally's aunt is really dying, but she does not understand that the cancer cells are spreading. The metastasized cancer will probably prove mortal. So there might be several words you don't know in here, like metastasize or mortal. But none of that is necessary. This is a bad argument because the words are changing. So this is the same person. Janice is Mrs. Smith is Sally's aunt. And again, this is the same meaning. Dying. Mortal. This is the same meaning. Metastasized. Spreading. These are the same meaning. Tumor. Cancer. Cancer cells. All of these things mean the same things. We don't need to say all these different words. We don't want to. Here's how we can avoid that. Janice does not believe she has cancer. Janice thinks allergy medicine is curing her cancer. Janice is dying. That's all we need. Okay. The next concept that we want to look at is the idea of loaded language. So I've been trying to think of how best to explain this for non-native speakers. Maybe we could say plus alpha adjectives. So words that mean one thing and say a second thing. So for instance, there is a terrible American. Since he is terrible, he probably committed the crime. This argument seems like it could be pretty good. There's someone who's terrible, the terrible person is committing crimes. But if we get rid of the word terrible, all that we're left with is there is an American, thus he probably committed the crime. This is not a good argument. This is quite weak. All right. Here are some examples of words that you probably shouldn't use in your arguments. Despicable, disgusting, horrifying, abusive, lovely, delightful, dignified, honorable, scary, terrible, wonderful, important. Usually the argument will be just as good, if not better, if we take these sorts of words out. So, there's several types of language we want to avoid. So we want to avoid biased terms. So bias is henken, or even bias in Japanese. So we want to avoid anything that's that way. So we want to avoid saying things like Alex is a scumbag, or a scumbag like Alex cannot be trusted, consequently Alex is the murderer. Again, there's nothing left in this argument if we get rid of the word scumbag. If we cross it out, then all that we're trying to say is Alex is the murderer, but we don't have any argument for that. Another example. Are you going to listen to a quack like Kazuya or Dr. Kamazinski? Kazuya thinks you should pay your rent. Therefore, you should not pay your rent. Again, so we're calling him a quack. But the next claim has nothing to do with that. Whether you should pay your rent and whether he knows you should pay your rent he doesn't need to be a fake doctor or a real doctor to know these sorts of things. So, I want to summarize this week's flip and call it a day. There's some different ways of talking about arguments. There are good versus bad arguments. This is an idea we saw last week. But there's also two important rules to think about when making arguments. The first rule is that we want to be clear. The second rule is that we want to argue based on logic, not emotional or loaded language. So the center of what we want to do is logic. We combine these with the rules we learned last time, and we have all the skills we need 
to make good arguments. In subsequent flips, we're going to learn how to make good deductive arguments and then good inductive arguments. But we need this basis, these fundamental skills to be able to do that. So I'm Andrew Kamazinski at Hokkaido University of Education in Asaikawa, and this has been a flip. This is the fourth flip and the third one that students are required to watch as part of their homework. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions, please feel free to leave them on the YouTube video. Thank you for your time and attention, and have a good evening, a good morning, or a good day.